Well, since no one invited me up, I'm inviting myself up. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for uh, coming to this uh, first group of 30 occasional lecture. Uh, and thanks to our speaker, Raghuram Rajan, it's uh, off to an excellent start. Uh, Raghu's um, well known to all of us, but let me just uh, start uh, by thanking uh, Managing Director Christine Lagarde and Secretary of the Fund, Chen Hai, for agreeing to host uh, this group of 30 lecture. Um, and um, thank everyone else for uh, coming. Uh, it's uh, on the record, I should add, and we're very happy that we've got um, uh, members of the press present, uh, and that me before calling on Raghu first uh, invite Christine to give a few opening remarks. Christine. Oops. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Taman. And uh, let me just tell you all that it's wonderful to see you in this room and to recognize so many uh, friendly and, and familiar faces. We're delighted uh, that you could make it. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome back home to the IMF our friend uh, Raghu Rajan. And for those of you who don't know, he belongs to this institution for having been its chief economist and, and uh, head of the research department in a previous life. Um, I believe that uh, the IMF and the G30, under the leadership of its uh, uh, chairman of the trustees, uh, emeritus chairman, and now new chairman, um, Dear Tarman, uh, the IMF and the G30 have something in common. They try to learn from experience, from the knowledge that they accumulate and share amongst themselves, how to actually advise leaders in order to make this world a better place and to make sure that the growth that we have is sustainable and more inclusive. And I'm sorry to repeat myself for those of you who have already listen to me on that page, but we are clearly focused on these issues of better growth, more inclusive growth, and all of that in a cooperative setting that actually brings people together rather than spreads them apart. And I know that it's not entirely related to the theme that Raghu is going to address, because he has a much broader page and a much broader issue to uh, address, which he could tackle from multiple angles, from political to philosophical to economic to sociological and on and on and on and certainly on a cross-border basis. But we believe that to address those issues, at least from an economic point of view, in our position and hopefully with the support, the help and the guidance of the G30, we can also focus on those issues of growth, how sustainable, how fueled by better productivity and how more inclusive it can be going forward. This sentiment of populism in the views of many is fueled by the feeling of being excluded, of being left out. And what better than more growth, more equitably shared in order to respond to that particular issue. So I'm not suggesting that uh, you will be addressing and providing responses to those uh, concerns of ours, the enigma of productivity, uh, the uh, mysterious way in which growth can be better shared. But I would hope that with the very uh, talented uh, lecturer that we have and under the uh, presidency of, uh, of Tarman, the G30 can at least guide us with its uh, collective brain power and light uh, in order to address those questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christine, for those very thoughtful remarks. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Raghuram Rajan, and his uh, lecture on populist insurrections, causes, consequences, and policy reactions. Uh, Christine referred to Raghu's uh, former life. So let me just say that um, in all Raghu's um, uh, incarnations, uh, he has distinguished himself. Uh, First, uh, we know him very well as chief economist and director of research at the fund. 
Uh, we know him very well for his work um, in India, uh, culminating in his uh, tenure as governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And of course, uh, he's now back in academia, which is where he first made his mark as the first, uh, the inaugural recipient of the American Finance Association uh, Prize for the uh, most outstanding uh, finance researcher under 40. I think it was called the Fisher Black uh, uh, Prize. That was some time ago. And Raghu is now back in Chicago as the Catherine Dusak Distinguished Service Professor of Finance. Uh, I should add that Raghu is a respected and active member of the Group of 30. So Raghu, uh, over to you for your lecture. We've been waiting for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tharman. Uh, thank you, Managing Director, for uh, raising this occasion. And uh, let me uh, start by saying that uh, most people in industrial countries used to believe that their children would have a better future than their already very pleasant present. Unfortunately, this is no longer true. And that really is part of the reason for the angst that we see. Now, a lot of people locate this anxiousness with the financial crisis, and clearly the financial crisis did play a role, which I'll come to in, in just uh, a moment. But I think what we should not miss is the longer term effects of the IT revolution and its magnification by the fact that it spread by trade across the world very quickly. And of course, a lot of research has gone into this, and we do know that over the last so many years, uh, routine jobs have been outsourced or automated, and sometimes they've first been outsourced, then automated, then insourced after that. One example is handwritten doctor notes. Uh, as you know, most doctors write in illegible uh, uh, forms. <laughs> and it used to be that there was a whole retinue of people after that who'd look at what they wrote and transcribe them into stuff other people could read. Okay, into, into files and so on. And then they discovered that, you know, why do this in the United States? We can do it in, uh, in some other English-speaking country where labor is much cheaper, so it was outsourced. You scanned the doctor notes in and sent it abroad, and it came back in the evening with the doctor notes uh, actually transcribed. Of course, now we've got smart uh, uh, iPads and, uh, and, and laptops where the doctor scribbles and immediately the handwriting software figures out what the doctor wrote and for the most part is fairly accurate. And so it's been brought back now, uh, this time automated. But what this means is that there is a whole class of people doing jobs uh, who are rendered redundant both by technology and by trade. And clearly the anxiousness this has created is high, and the despair is very real. Uh, I think the work of Angus Deaton and Anne Case is often cited. What we've seen in the last uh, 14, 15 years, between 1999 and 2013 is the duration of their study, where they find that when you look at middle-aged white males between the ages of, I think, 15 and 64, there are 500,000 more deaths than would be predicted looking at comparable death rates for other groups. Now that number is something to think about. It's about the same period as the Vietnam War, but it's 10 times more deaths than the Vietnam War. And these are deaths because of suicide, the deaths, deaths because of drugs, because of alcohol, uh, basically uh, ways of dying that suggest that these people did not uh, have happy lives. Um, it resembles the kind of death rates we saw with Soviet males uh, after the breakup of the Soviet Union and suggests that the causes may be quite similar. And the problem, of course, is the relentless forces of trade and technology are not going to slow down. Uh, many of you have heard talk about, uh, for example, driverless cars. 
Uh, today, there are three and a half million truck drivers in the United States as their jobs get automated. Uh, the main, uh, one main source of employment for high school educated males is going to go. But it's not just the driverless cars uh, uh, and, and, and the truck driving industry which, which gets depleted. Think also of all the other industries which relate to, the, uh, to uh, car driving. For example, insurance. One of the main uh, sort of uh, um, aspects of auto insurance today is we have driver records. We know what the driver does, what his behavior is. Now, going forward, if we are talking about automated driving, uh, driverless cars, uh, there is no driver. So who are you going to hold up if there's an accident? Well, typically, you're going to blame some manufacturer. Uh, it's going to be, did the software work? Who has liability? Did the hardware work? The nature of insurance changes considerably. It's not about trying to figure out whether the uh, driver was at fault and so on. Insurance is going to change considerably from insuring the driver to insuring the manufacturer. Or even the manufacturer might decide to forego insurance and offer liability protection on their own. So we are going to see a tremendous change in, uh, in uh, industry. And this is going to get, get worse. Now, what I want to focus in this talk, you can go, uh, you can write a whole book on it. In fact, uh, this is my occupation post, uh, post retirement from the RBI. Uh, but I want to ask five questions. First, why is the anger focused so much on trade? When you talk to an economist, they'll say trade is not the issue. There's so much more job displacement going on because of technology. So why do we focus on trade when technology is the bigger issue? Visibility may be one answer, but I'll, uh, I'll argue there's another answer. Second question is, why now? These forces have been at work for the last 35, 40 years. Why is it that it has peaked in the populist movement now? Third, the kind of people who are upset and angry are typically people you would think would go towards the left, look for redistribution. Instead, they're going towards the right, the populist, nationalist right. Why is it that we're moving in that direction rather than to the left? Fourth, uh, what are the consequences if the policies that are being proposed are fully implemented? What, what are the policy consequences? What are the longer-term consequences? And fifth, I'm going to make an assertion that the populist nationalists, at least given their present agenda, will fail. And I'll try and explain why I think they will fail and why we need better answers. So let me start first with, with trade. Um, I'm going to argue, using an IMF phrase, uh, why trade is so much more visible. And the phrase I'm going to use is concentrated and differentiated impact of trade. Uh, why? I, I'm going to use data from the US because it's much better documented, at least for US-based economists. Um, you know, manufacturing used to be 39.5% of the labor force in 1943. Now it is only 8.5%. So there's been a steady erosion of manufacturing jobs. Also, when you look at the job losses in manufacturing, uh, a very detailed set of studies by Asimoglu, Otor, Dorn, Hansen, and Price, many of the job losses in manufacturing are associated with uh, 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 with technology rather than trade. If you link, if you try and find out how many job losses because of trade, you basically come up with something like 10 to 20 percent. This is an imprecise art rather than a science, but 10 to 20 percent of the job losses in manufacturing have been because of trade, the rest because of, uh, uh, of, um, of technology. Uh, a third factoid is that people talk about manufacturing disappearing from the US. If you look at the share of value added that manufacturing contributes to the US, it has remained steady at around 12% since the 1970s. In other words, what's happened in manufacturing is it has lost, the US has lost jobs, but it has remained relatively competitive because of gains in productivity and because of shifts to sectors where it has greater competitive advantage. Uh, essentially, the U.S. has been holding its own in manufacturing, but moving away from the low-tech, assembly-based industries to higher-tech industries where there's been much stronger productivity growth. So all this would say, you know, 
that why is it that people are so focused on trade and saying we are losing in manufacturing, we have to restore manufacturing, when in fact the US is doing reasonably well in manufacturing? And I would argue the reason is because job losses in manufacturing are much more concentrated than job losses in because of technology. Uh, jo job losses in manufacturing because of trade. And, and the point here is that many manufacturing establishments are clustered. Uh, around certain areas that when in fact that industry takes a hit, a lot of establishments close. Uh, example, uh, you, the US steel plant in Granite City, Illinois, with a few other steel manufacturers around, uh, is down from 1250 workers to around 300 workers in the steel union. Why these enormous job losses? Because it has happened in one industry. The, the local area has basically one industry employing. In cities, it's far more diversified, and uh, often the, the effects of technology tend to hit much wider rather than much more concentrated. And also, these effects, where uh, the effect on trade uh, hits locally, tends to affect the moderately educated the most. Typically, the higher educated, the people with degrees in the industry, shift industry. They move out of steel, they move into other industries because they management they can do anywhere. But the steel worker, basically, who has a high school education, essentially doesn't have those kinds of options. They have to retrain if they move to something else, maybe become a nurse, maybe become uh, uh, a, a, a software engineer. That retraining is very costly, and they have no idea at the end of, it, of that whether they'll have a job. So retraining to move up is very hard for the moderately educated worker. What they can do is move to areas where there are jobs and move down, move to the job of security guard, move to the job of uh, um, working in a laundry or something else, the service jobs that are plentiful, that pay fairly little. But of course, moving and downgrading is extremely costly, especially when you have to pay the high rent in a city uh, which is unaffordable. So what studies suggest a lot of workers who are moderately educated do when their industry is dying is essentially they go from good job to moderate job to worse job in uh, uh, you know, uh, more and more fragile establishments. And when the last establishment in town closes, they go on disability in the United States. So what this is saying is that the problem with trade is it hits in a big way, in a very localized way, because it affects uh, entire industries and all the establishments in an industry which typically are clustered together, which leaves the community with very little form, forms of economic activity. And when there is little economic activity, then you get all the social consequences, teenage pregnancies, divorces, drugs and alcohol tied to economic decline, and essentially, uh, a community which is collapsing. Now, this has all happened in many countries, in Europe, in the United States, away from the cities, which are much more vibrant in terms of economic activity, much more diversified. And as a result, it has been easy for the governing elite in the cities to overlook what is happening in the flyover areas because the impact has been concentrated there and less visible in the big cities. So that's number one. Why trade? Because it has a much more concentrated effect on the moderately educated, and they have very little chance of, uh, re of moving or retooling themselves given the prevailing environment. Second, why now? Why the angst now? Because these job losses have been going on for so many years. Uh, as I said, since World War II, we've been losing manufacturing jobs in the United States. And I would argue that the global financial crisis did play an important role. It played an important role because it delegitimized the system. It basically said the global elite didn't foresee the global financial crisis, didn't prevent it, and didn't actually take us out. After eight years, we've had really slow growth. We haven't done enough, uh, and they don't know enough. That's one. Second. Look at who paid the price. We on Main Street paid the price. 
But those bankers who caused this problem, they were back to paying themselves big bonuses within a couple of years. They were the guys who were bailed out, but no banker has gone to jail. Of course, this statement is not exactly right, but, but it broadly captures the mood. So the global elite know how to take care of themselves, leaving us to pay the price. So lack of knowledge, number one, bias, number two. But there's a third, more insidious issue, and this is what makes the resolution difficult, which is as the uh, majority community workers who typically used to have the manufacturing jobs uh, start thinking about the system, earlier they used to think it was legitimate, now they think it's not working as well, they start also questioning all the policies of the government. And one of the policies of governments across the industrial world has been to reduce inequality, to bring up women, to bring up uh, poor immigrants, to bring up minorities. And the majority community worker in the US, white males, basically look around and say, I've been standing patiently in line, hoping for to achieve the American dream. This, these are the words of Ari Hochschild, a sociologist, who spent a long time talking to workers in Louisiana, and she says, one of the images they have is they were standing in line, patiently walking towards the American dream. The line was walking slower and slower, but they thought the line was legitimate. And here I'm putting words in. Post-global financial crisis, they realized that the line wasn't fair, that people were cutting in ahead of the line, that now there were women and immigrants and minorities moving ahead in line, and so they started reacting to the system. They started reacting to the system and saying the system as governed by the global elite who uh, are in our country also, essentially are part of the problem, right? Now, um, in addition, of course, the global financial crisis slowed the line even more because of the consequences, the economic consequences of the crisis. But it also made them more fearful about the future with public debt going up, with a lot of attention paid to unaffordable entitlements. And at this time, spreading entitlements wider, for example, the US attempt to spread healthcare more widely, raised concerns, is this going to the others? And is this going to jeopardize my future entitlement? And lastly, I think we should also recognize the fact that we've had a new means of communication uh, in this period. Uh, it used to be when Gutenberg invented the printing press, it prompted worries that, quote, printed books and broadsheets would undermine religious authority, demean the work of scholars and scribes, and spread sedition and debauchery. In the 30s, we had the radio. With the radio, Father Cochlin was one of the first political leaders to use radio to reach a mass audience. And up to 30 million users tuned into his broadcasts. He was finally forced off the air in 1939, but he was a vociferous campaigner against immigrants at that time. Uh, some argue he was a, a, a right-wing extremist. One of his campaign slogans was less care for internationalism and more concern for national prosperity, something we hear all over again today. I think with social media, with Twitter, with Facebook, once again, the people who want to connect directly can bypass the establishment. Over time, the establishment learns how to control these means of communication. But it's learned once again to bypass these means of communication and echo the anguish that the people uh, actually feel. So in this environment, the populist nationalists come in and they find an audience willing to hear. I think we must flag the breakdown of communities, the alienation of people in these communities which are becoming dysfunctional as key to the message, to the popularity of the message that is, that is being uh, spread. The problem with mainstream parties is they focus on growth without recognizing that too many people cannot participate in that growth. Because in these dysfunctional communities, it is very hard to get a good education, no matter how much money you 
uh, spread into the schools because outside the schools, uh, the environment is not conducive, uh, and the few people who survive that are, are, are really very few and far between. Moreover, you would think that in this kind of environment, the workers who are uh, at this point feel downtrodden uh, would look to the left. But the left seems to have an agenda which is different from their own. The radical left and some parts of the liberal elite look to tax the 1% and redistribute, but redistribute to all, including the historically disadvantaged minorities via go government programs. But this is not what the majority working group which has been laid off or which is uh, finding few economic opportunities wants. They don't want the other downtrodden to come up to their level. They want them where they are. They want to move up themselves, right? And these are the stagnant median wages uh, are not envious about the 1%. Um, they fear sliding into the, the, the historically disadvantaged and being seen as one of them rather than as being seen as distinct in the middle class themselves. So this is a, a, a sociological phenomenon. People uh, do fear merging into uh, the groups that they think below them. And the populist nationalist understands this. He understands that they want to experience a sense of community once again. Uh, they don't want to be alienated. And the mainstream parties and the experts don't offer them an answer. So he provides an answer. I'll bring back your jobs. I'll restore your community life. I'll abandon all these international agreements that have been entered into by the elite in this country, not keeping your, your interests at heart. And I am going to create a community of people who look like you. That old, warm, glowing community, which you remember of your childhood, we're going to recreate that. You will have your jobs. You will have your community. And we'll keep out all these uh, others who have essentially polluted the stream. So there is a strong emphasis on going back to tradition, on social norms, on uh, bringing uh, a much bigger role for the church and on anti-immigration, but this is a response to a community which is dysfunctional and alienated. How do we uh, bring back a sense of community? And it's very appealing. It's very appealing. Now, in a sense, what they want to do is, uh, in the words of Benedict Anderson, he's a sociologist, he talks about imagined communities. This suggesting an imagined national community where we're all gonna feel uh, the sense of brotherhood and the ties will be the ties that come from ethnic commonality uh, and national commonality that we've been in this country for long years and keep out, uh, at least uh, figuratively, uh, the others. Now, let me talk a little bit about policy, then I'll end by saying why I think this program can, cannot succeed. Well, in the short run, the, pro uh, the, the, the answers seem to be, let's back off from the policies that have been proposed by the elite. Uh, increasingly, a concern about regulations, regulations driven by things like climate change. Emissions, emissions are a big issue in the United States. Those emission requirements determined in Washington or sometimes in California, the one state that has opt out. Why do we have to respond to this national uh, sort, of, um, um, uh, sort of diktat on emissions coming from there? Why don't we have more flexibility? Because after all, these rules and emissions kill jobs. Let's do away. Let's create a bonfire of these kinds of regulations of energy and, and clean air uh, regulations, because that will create more space for us to grow. Uh, it is in part a concern about the centralization of policy, and I'll come to that in a second, that policy is not just centralized globally, but it's also centralized nationally. And the community or the local uh, area has much less choice. And in a world with integrated markets, not having local political choice to respond is a very real concern. And these people are essentially articulating that concern. There's also associated with this less of a concern with respecting institutions. 
because after all, the populace gets a mandate from the people. It is not a mandate to respect the law. The institutions are created by the elite, and the people have just told me we need to change. So this marks the attitude towards international agreements that one has entered into. It also, for example, in a number of countries, marks the attitude towards central banks. I would argue central banks, I see many of my uh, former colleagues here, uh, central bankers are the quintessential elite, right? <laughs> they're always, they're unelected, they're highly educated, many of you have PhDs, many of us have PhDs. Uh, you talk a language that nobody else understands, <laughs> right? And you keep insisting on things like credibility, independence, etc., which basically says, trust us and let us run. No accountability. This is the kind of, of concern that the populist movement has. It has historically been seen that these are the targets of the populist movement. Now, the populist movement is also, in some ways, anti-minority, anti-immigrant. I don't think this is necessarily racist, but it is exclusionary. And it is exclusionary in order to develop a sense of identity, which has evaporated as the local community has broken down. Uh, Hannah Arendt, for example, talks about the importance of alienation in explaining why some of these uh, nationalist populist policies have, uh, have, uh, have appeal. And, and I, I don't think the nationalist populists were the first to start identity politics. We've had identity politics, forms of affirmative action before, some of which were very necessary. But I think the identity politics of today is in some ways a reaction to that and saying, you're holding them up, what about holding me up? And so we get a new identity politics, this time more dangerous because it's a much bigger group. And it's more dangerous because you constantly need the presence of enemies or outsiders to reinforce what is really a, a very thin, tenuous link, a link based on ethnicity rather than something which is local and based on uh, everyday life and common purpose. So the problem, of course, is that where does this all end? Where does this kind of identity-based intervention, either favoring majority groups or favoring minority groups end? Unfortunately, it ends in crony capitalism. And uh, it, it's sort of a reaction to excessive market, but it eventually ends in shutting down competition and creating favored entities from different groups who have access and position only because they belong to the groups, not because they're competitive. And we can see countries around the world where this kind of identity politics has, in fact, resulted in great inefficiency and, and uh, uh, great centralization and effectively significant exclusion. Now, obviously, there are economic policies amongst the populist nationalists which we think will probably fail uh, we think that going back on trade is probably a bad thing, is going to uh, harm us all. Uh, I think uh, those issues are well understood. We think excluding a large part of the population from active economic life, uh, if that is the eventual aim, is also going to be problematic uh, and is going to be harmful both uh, morally but also economically. But I would argue that there is another reason why the populist policy doesn't, uh, the populist nationalist doesn't grasp the, the, the detail of what is going on. Clearly, they understand that there's a strong opposition to the growing internationalization of, of policy, that policy is being moved up, right up to the euro area level or to the WTO level, and that there are rules being made there which the national uh, uh, um, uh, which the country has limited control over, stuff that is discussed in Paris on emissions, or stuff that is discussed in Basel on capital rules that they have no control over. That they're reacting to and saying, we don't want to outsource our, uh, our policies. Uh, Brexit, in some ways, is, is, is a loud cry in that, in that direction. But what they don't recognize as much is that even within country, 
there is a growing anxiousness about centralization of policy. Within Britain, I would argue, there's as much angst about policy being sent to Brussels, but also about policy being sent to London. Why is London setting policies for the rest of us when London experiences a differentiated experience from the semi-rural uh, and semi-urban areas in, in the UK? So there is a strong cry in these populist nationalist movements about regaining control. It, uh, in part, is because we have uh, outsourced policy uh, in a big way uh, in order to facilitate uh, global markets, but it's also in part because we have centralized policy within countries, again, in order to facilitate a national market. And so one question is, is this something that is tenable in the long run? When you have markets which are global, which you have little control over, where the effects of markets are very differentiated and unequal within a country, can you afford to centralize policy? to harmonize regulations, as the Europeans uh, call it, in a strong way, will there not be a reaction? You've taken away our ability to manage economically because we're forced to compete across the world, but you've also taken away our ability to react politically because you've limited our ability to bail out our banks, you've limited our ability to determine capital requirements for our banks, just giving you financial sector examples, you've limited our ability to decide what our emissions should be. And as a result, we have lost control. So I would argue that perhaps we should think, given that global markets means more differentiated uh, impact of decisions across the country, should we take the lesson away that perhaps we've gone too far in centralizing political control in globalizing political control, and should we perhaps recognize that part of the message, if you want to capture the guys who are worried about, uh, who are influenced by the populist nationalists, we want to recapture some of them again, say perhaps we want to restore decision making. And that leads to my last point. Uh, I mean, essentially what I'm saying is let the perfect not be the enemy of the good, right? The perfect is, we all agree to common rules. We all agree to a global market. That was the direction we were going in. That's the direction the Euro area was going in. But if the people wouldn't let us go there. The people reacted before we got there and said, thus far and no more. We don't like this feeling of helplessness when, in fact, you integrate so much. And so I would argue that perhaps we should focus on preserving at least what we have by recognizing this very legitimate cry for regaining control by giving back some of the powers that have been, have been centralized and internationalized. And we have to think about what those powers are that are most, uh, least helpful to create global markets, but most harmful in creating a sense of helplessness at the local level. Second point, this is the last point, is if you want to decentralize control, what happens about the communities that have no capacity to take back that control, where the community is uh, broken down? How do we essentially rehabilitate communities that have broken down? Uh, the communities plagued by drugs, uh, uh, lack of jobs, and so on. And I think here, again, the populists say we'll bring the old jobs back. And we all know those old jobs aren't coming back. Coal mining is not going to come back. Um, so the question is, have we offered an answer? And the, answer is, uh, and, and, and the response is no. We haven't offered an answer to these communities. They have been overlooked. But it's not just they have been overlooked. It's also if you want a community-directed effort, you have to you run up very quickly against the fact that not all communities are created equal. And the historically disadvantaged, if you help them, the majority community may get angry. If you help the majority community while not help helping the dis historically disadvantaged, the historically disadvantaged get angry, right? So there is a need, I think, to build a national consensus. And this is an opportune moment to say there is broad-based rehabilitation needed in some of the industrial countries, to lift up the forgotten man in the terms of President uh, Trump, 
But the forgotten man is not just in the majority community. The forgotten man is also in the ghettos in the cities. How do we have a national consensus to lift up both the forgotten men as well as the forgotten women? And I think for that, we have to think about how we rebuild communities. How do we bring economic activity to these, uh, to these communities? And of course, there have been success stories of uh, deteriorating communities turned around and built. It requires leadership. It requires a certain amount of funding. It requires a lot, lot of uh, uh, new thinking. But essentially, what I, I would argue is industrial countries have large areas which need development. In the same way as emerging markets and developing countries need development, you need to put some of those Chinese local government officials in charge of some of these communities to rebuild the infrastructure, to create jobs, to focus on generating economic activity. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a joke, but of course, I think we need to think seriously about rebuilding these communities. Otherwise, I think uh, given the fact that the pace of technological change is going to actually increase, and if we keep markets open, the effects of trade are also going to increase, I think the problems are only going to get worse. Now, in the long run, we all know, keep markets open. Keynes in 1930, in economic prospects for our grandchildren, talked about the concern that there would be mass unemployment. And he said it was a good thing. He said it was 100 years from now, people will be figuring out what to do with their lives because there won't be much work in about one fourth or one fifth of the time we spend working today will manage to produce enough for everybody to be happy. The mistake he made in his, in his pronouncement was not about human productivity or our, cap our capacity to produce. He was dead on. He said, we'll have the capacity to produce eight times what we produce today per capita. And he was right. We're pretty close to that. What he was wrong about is he thought human wants would remain constant. Instead, human wants have grown to expand to essentially buy all that is produced. The average work week used to be 45 hours in 1930. It is now 40 hours. So we haven't come down. We are not all spending our time gazing, navel gazing, or figuring out what text of philosophy to read because we're all fully occupied. And so over the medium term, one could imagine that despite the uh, advent of robots, et cetera, we will find work to do. It'll be different work, but we'll find work. However, in the short run, there are significant adjustment costs. And those adjustment costs are often borne by people who have the ability, if they collect, to overthrow the system. And so my point here is that the, every technological revolution is disruptive. Every technological revolution is usually followed by a societal response. We haven't had that societal response this time thus far. We have to think about what that is. The populist nationalists offer a historical response, which often is muddled, but is basically reflects a cry of anger and for help. And I think we should respond to that by figuring out what to do. And I want to emphasize, I've talked about industrial countries, but populist nationalism is not just an issue in industrial countries. It pervades the globe today. Among the targeted responses, and there are many more, should be thinking about decentralizing more decisions than we do today and increasing the capacity of local government, local communities to make those decisions to have vibrant communities, uh, communities that are stronger than the virtual communities we have today. And, uh, and finally, I think we absolutely need to embark on this uh, if we are to preserve the open, vibrant markets. It can't be just a point of reducing inequality. We have to also sell the message, which inequality are we going to reduce, how are we going to reduce it, and take people on board. And that requires far greater political action than we see today. Let me stop here. Well, thanks, Raghu, for that um, very stimulating um, talk and somewhat provocative uh, conclusions, particularly on um, taking back 
control and uh, whether we've gone too far in centralizing and globalizing uh, rules. Uh, I open the floor to open questions to the floor. Yes, uh, the two in front there. If you could just uh, introduce yourself very briefly before you ask it. Hi, I'm Greg Ip with the Wall Street Journal. Um, mm -hmm. Raghu, you point out that these um, movements are global. Uh, I want to mention three countries that have actually not just seen these movements, but where the nationalists have formed governments, Poland, Hungary, and India, uh, your own country. But these are three countries that have not actually been among the worst economic performers uh, since the crisis period. So what explains the popularity of these movements in these countries and the absence of worse economic outcomes? And I was wondering if you could especially reflect on what you learned in India by the growth of that nationalist movement. So Greg, unfortunately, I I've, uh, sort of have a commitment to myself not to speak on India for a year. Uh, I think it's good to leave space for my successor and let him speak. Uh, as I don't want uh, uh, any confusion about who I'm speaking for. Uh, my guess is the forces are uh, obviously, uh, there are parallels, but they're not exact parallels. Uh, I think in many of these countries where nationalist movements have, have come, there is uh, certainly some sense of loss of control. I think in Hungary you had a lot of talk about whether they had to accept the immigrants uh, that were being sent there uh, by the Euro area. So I think these things get highlighted around certain issues. Uh, for example, uh, I, I was told by a friend yesterday that in, in the UK, a big issue was the British toaster. Uh, whether the European Union had taken away the British toaster because it didn't approve of the design. So uh, these are the kinds of, of, of almost uh, trivial examples of uh, a sense of loss of control. Now, I don't want to say every nationalist movement is driven by this. Nationalist movements are also driven by ethnic rivalry within countries, and those can be uh, uh, sources of concern. But uh, I do want to say that uh, there is a commonality in many of these. I am taking back power for you. Yes. So to follow up on that a little bit, um, decentralization, there's a lot of problems with that, right? I mean, if, if I think about climate change, you know, it's, it's the essence of, a, of externalities and a public good that you have to have a, a control from the top or you won't make progress if you give control to the local, uh, at the local level, everybody will act in their own interest to the detriment of the public good. Um, well, and, and similarly, just another example, and I think this gets to the inequalities and the racial and ethnic tensions, like a lot of what was happening in, in the US election was racial and immigrant, and, and if you cede sort of control over human rights or human right protections to the local communities, a lot of them will violate them. No, so, so be careful, I'm not saying that you decentralize everything or give up human rights protections and so on. I think there's a lot of good that has been done. I'm not even saying give, you, give up affirmative action. I'm, 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 what I'm saying is let's examine each of the things we've taken up into Washington or into Brussels um, or into the Paris Accord and see do we really need every one of these to be done there. Let me give you emissions as an example. So there is a sense that we have to force the emerging markets to do this, right? Now, look at the state of Indian cities. Look at the state of Chinese cities. There is a very strong internal movement to say we need to control, because of local pollution, we need to control our emissions, right? And so there are much stronger forces domestically than you know, these international agreements that are forcing a change, right? International agreements help. I'm not saying they, they don't, but do we need to do everything in that way and then put layer and layer to make sure countries are actually following up when, in fact, in many situations, there is self-interest in doing that? Let me give you another example, capital requirements for banks. Yes, we want a basic minimal level of capital requirements. But beyond that, <clears throat> right, do you think that a country where the banks have too low capital requirements will be able to do, too, too low levels of capital, will be able to do business internationally? You know, banks are going to say, these guys don't have that much capital. I'm going to back off, right? 
so the, the, the point is, and, and if, if you come into my space, I can impose my capital requirements on you. I can insist that you have domestically incorporated entities, that you don't do it through the branch method. I have control. In your country, do what you want. And if you have too low capital, you will see that you have to pay out a huge amount, and people won't want to do business with your banks. Um, uh, Stefan was here. I don't want to uh, make his life more difficult by questioning uh, Basel. We've come a long way. I don't, but I, what I'm trying to put on the table is let us ask whether each of the things we have international agreements over should actually be done on the basis of international agreement. Even if there's a little bit of leakage, can we accept that leakage in order to send decision making a little back to the countries and from the countries? to the uh, states and the local areas. Gentleman, second row. Thank you. Uh, Sergey Gurif, EBRD. I, I would like you to elaborate more on the trade-off between inclusion and growth. You almost sounded like we need to focus on inclusion rather than on growth. But without growth, you actually have a zero-sum game, which you specified, redistributing from majorities to minorities and back. And in that sense, conflict is inevitable. No, I don't think the two are, are necessarily at, at odds with each other. What I'm saying is growth by itself will not fix the tension because there are large communities that are sure. not able okay. to participate in the growth. You generate the growth, but it passes them by. Okay. You need to find a way for that growth to reach them, which needs special action, rather than saying growth will lift all ships. It lift a little bit, but these ships need to be lift, these boats need to be lifted much more. I also had a second question, sorry, about why now. There is also another explanation of why now, which is a faster speed of technological change, which means previously you're a coal miner, uh, you lose your occupation when you're 50 or 60, you retire, but your kids become belly dancers, right? The question is now that uh, you're a coal miner, you need another occupation by the time you're 35. And uh, that is, as you rightly said, is much harder. To what extent? This is an explanation of why now. It could be, but of course, uh, the, uh, the famous example that economists use is the, is the coach, coach driver, right, when, when cars came on. I presume they also suffered a big change in the span of 10 to 15 years. Uh, I don't think driverless cars are tomorrow, but over the next 5 to 10 years, they will come in. Uh, so uh, maybe a little faster. I think the problem is that the educational requirements that are needed to compete in the new economy are harder than they were before. And there is a very real question, uh, do we all, uh, you know, we all have the mental capacity for a high school education. Uh, is it going to be so easy if you haven't had a basic uh, primary education to move up from a high school education further? Are we sort of permanently impaired by the education we had as kids? I mean, to some extent, Heckman, uh, my colleague at Chicago, says you are impaired. So how do we deal with those kinds of things? I think those are often the source of angst. We can't go to school. We don't know how. We've never been taught properly. The gentleman right at the back first, and then Laura. Hi, it's Sean Donnan from the Financial Times. If you break Donald Trump's economic message right down, he promises two things, growth and jobs. So uh, two questions. Do you share the view that growth is coming back in the global economy, that the global economy is somehow turning a corner? And secondly, do you agree that growth fixes a big part of the populist problem? Um, I think growth uh, helps, and I think uh, there is uh, for the first time in seven or eight years, a sense of optimism that all the engines have started firing. Uh, and certainly the IMF has revised upwards, unlike its uh, previous revisions downwards, uh, uh, revised upwards, I think for the first time in a long time, uh, its growth projections. So that's, that's uh, I think, uh, comfortable. Um, I think part of the growth agenda are the policies that, uh, you know, including tax reform, including infrastructure build out. I do believe certain forms of infrastructure build out, for example, spreading broadband, uh, can actually bring a whole lot of service uh, jobs to the, to the hinterland, the, the, the flyover states, so to speak, that have been bypassed, where the manufacturing jobs have gone. 
perhaps with, with easy access uh, to the internet, some of those jobs can be recreated there. I also think that perhaps we've gone a little far on regulation, uh, and uh, some of the deregulation, if, if appropriately done, uh, could be uh, very positive for growth. So there are aspects of growth that could be re-energized, and if that also includes significant investment in the economy from the private sector, that could also enhance growth potential going forward. So possibilities? I think yes. Laura, and then the lady just beside you. Uh, just a, an observation and then a question. The observation is just, uh, I guess, to confirmational of the uh, emphasis on uh, decentralization, and that is, at the during the populist revolution, as it occurred, uh, Obama, when he left office, was extremely popular, very popular with the, with the public. And um, the other thing to say, though, is that state and local governments had not lost the trust of the population the way the federal government had done. So if you actually look at polls just at that time, where it's, dis it's really disintegrated is at the level of the federal government. Not, not at the level of the person, because Obama himself had, but at the level of the federal government. But there is still, and even in the midst of this destruction of community, there has been a high degree of trust by the population in their local government and in their state government. So that's confirmational. Uh, what I will say, though, is that a lot of this trust, and this is where, you know, the, the po I think you have to explain the populist swing to the right, because basically the policies that are going to be pursued here are traditional Republican policies in red states. And those states had already been swinging to the right for a long time. And furthermore, the swing to the right of states that, uh, that have essentially brought the US map to look very red have been around wedge issues like abortion and like race. And so I, I really think that you have to take those into account a little bit more than just the economics here. But my question now is really about how this relates to uh, Danny Roderick's work. So th this notion that we've gone too far in our international agreements, he would say we've gone much too far in our trade agreements and that the only thing we can really harmonize is basically tariffs and things that are border controls. But if once we get into standards, different sense of what health is, what a toaster should look like, that we should stop all of this stuff because we cannot globalize those kinds of rules. And I was wondering if you just speculate a little bit more on that assertion. So what, what Danny says is, look, I've been proven right now. We were trying to have harmonization of things which cannot be harmonized at nation level. They may not even be harmonizational, if that's a word. They may not be possibly harmonized even at, within a nation. And I was wondering right. if you'd talk so, about that. So uh, first, your first observation about some of the social issues. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, I, I think those are tied to the sense of the uh, what I call the majority community and how they see themselves. And, and certainly, uh, you know, what's it, guns, something and something else. Uh, uh, I mean, that's part of how they define their identity. And there is a sense that that identity is being taken away. Uh, uh, not only is there competition from those that they stood uh, above, but that identity is also being taken away in, in many ways, whether it's uh, against the church or, or um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned abortion and so on. So I think it's easy to understand uh, uh, why those social issues also play a part uh, at a time when economically you feel so downtrodden. What do you have to cling on to? Uh, uh, that at least your sense of identity is there. Um, I do think that we need some rules. I'm not saying we don't need international rules. And I'm very much for trying to uh, agree together to bring down tariffs and so on so that we can have freer trade. The question is, how far do we go? And there I would say, uh, let's not define a toaster. <laughs> okay. Right. Hi, I'm Anata Dmati from Stanford. Uh, I was wondering what you think about the sort of power in the world of, of corporations. I think that we've gotten to a point where corporations have basically uh, are a bit out of, out of control, even including law enforcement. I mean, just right now you hear about how the OCC didn't even do anything about Wells Fargo, even though they knew for 
a decade about uh, about fraud, and we never go after anybody for uh, for that. And so, when globalism happens, and we do not invest in education, when when corporations seem to shop jurisdiction, when all these things are happening, I think the public anger is there, and then it's diverted towards you know Mexicans or immigrants or or global markets, where in fact. Uh, certain governments uh, are failing and collude with with corporations uh, against uh, against people, and they don't quite understand what's wrong, but something's wrong. Question? So the question is, what's the role of uh, of of the uh, of just the the corporate form right. in in this? I, I think uh, uh, there is a, a a rethinking of of various aspects of society we need to undertake. Uh, one of our PhD students, uh, Simcha, uh, has a study where he shows that we're seeing the returns to capital, uh, the share of capital increase, but actually a big share of that is a share of profits. And so we, he essentially makes the point we're seeing uh, you know, uh, profits go up, which makes you worried that, uh, that perhaps this has been captured by a few. And uh, the economist has been talking for a long time about excessively concentrated industries and so on. Certainly, we need to rethink some of that. There's also, uh, I think there's a point Jean Tirole makes, uh, Nobel Prize winner in, uh, in 2012, whether we can enlist corporations in more social responsibility activities where they bring their capabilities to bear. Now again, I mean, ultimately, the best thing a corporation can do is make a good product at a cheap price. But they have capabilities, and can they use them in some ways? Can we enlist them? So we need to rethink all those things. But well, you know, uh, uh, the, if they're lobbying against bad rules, sometimes uh, that that's a economically efficient function. Uh, the uh, but I, I, I would, uh, on the one hand, agree that there's been far more evidence of wrongdoing, especially in the financial sector, than we imagined before. Including these rigged markets and uh, you know some uh, notions of insider trading. On the other hand, we have to be careful that we don't create a climate of uh, of saying all corporations are bad. There are there are good corporations, and uh, we don't go excessively in the other direction and make it hard for them to do their legitimate work. So balance, I think, is really important here. Uh. Yeah, I'll come to you, but uh, we are running out of time, so, and I want to give some preference to white males, so. Uh, <laughs> ja ja uh, the Jacob, uh, Axel, and the gentleman in the second row first. Thank you. Uh, Jacob Frankel, Group of 30. Uh, a fascinating talk, thank you very much. I want to come back to the question of uh, did we go too far and to connect it with the issue of externality, because the whole rationale of having gone was the externality. So the real questions are, there are really three issues. Who decides? What is the quality of the decision? And who implements? And who is the authority? If indeed, in view of the externalities, we designed a system that generated good decisions, the question is, can we replicate those good decisions, if they were good, in a setting which is not subject to the question of have we gone uh, too far. Let's take the FSB. Uh, in the FSB, it, I would not think ever that you would say, let's eliminate the FSB because we have given too far. But I would consider an interpretation that says they know the externalities they can compute stuff. They can set, as a result, some standards. But they should not have the authority to tell us what to do. They will be extraordinarily good advisors for what you do, what we need to do, or the basel for that. And then comes your other point, which is very astute, namely, let, let it be the competitive edge in the market. So at the end of the day, if we know what the BIS computed for us, uh, maybe we like to adopt it ourselves. So the question is, is the anger about the fact that somebody else computed, or is it that somebody else tells us what to do? I think it is more the latter, and there the information and the competitive edge can take 
care of it in principle. But there are areas of health that do not recognize borders, or areas of that area, of which is probably a, a Right. It's a good question, but no, well, I, I can use the market, I would use it. I, I, I agree. Uh, I would say that part of our failing in some of these areas is explaining it back to the people, that this is why we're doing it and this is why the common agreement makes sense. Often we've found it too hard to accept any compromise on what we do, uh, and we've sort of not tried to explain it at all. Uh, you know the common uh, uh, sense in, 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 the, in Europe that all the good stuff the politicians take credit for and all the bad stuff is blamed on Brussels. Well, that's because we, we're not trying to explain. This is why we need to do this stuff. And that's where the notion of externality, that's where the notion of if we reach a common agreement, it's better than individual. We haven't tried to explain it. And to my mind, uh, Part of it is, is giving back some decisions. Part of it is explaining what we keep, why that is so important to keep at a global or national level. And that dialogue, to my mind, we have to have sooner rather than later, uh, just telling, us, telling them, trust us. That trust is gone. The moment the trust went, you couldn't say, trust us. We're doing what we're, you know, we're sitting in this closed door uh, in, in Brussels, Basel, uh, Paris, and, and uh, you know, Believe us, we're working for your good. But it has to be said that the FSB uh, um, does not have legally enforceable uh, rules. They are formed by pure consensus, and they are, if there's any enforcement, it's by moral suasion. And uh, if you're referring to the capital standards uh, that have been applied here in the United States, those are typically standards applied on top of uh, Basel rules by uh, national uh, uh, decision making. Right, but th that, that common uh, sort of consensus, and I think you're absolutely right, it doesn't have international, uh, it's not international law, it's not domestic law. Right. And that, in a sense, is the real problem. If somebody says, why? Why did you agree to this? We don't have an answer. <laughs> Uh, who is this that is imposing it on us? We just agreed to impose it on ourselves. Axel. Rug, with some of your discussion, and it was a fascinating talk, reminded me of a long debate in Europe about subsidiarity, which in my view always focused on the right thing, namely not do things have to get done centrally or at local levels, but really what can best get done at central levels and what can actually be delegated to more local government. And unfortunately, in the European debate, the regional and local have been losing out to national and European or even global debates. And I think you're right in, in your judgment that at least the people in Europe, from what you hear after Brexit in particular, are wanting a new discussion on that. And the thing I'm concerned about, and I'd like to hear some comment from you, maybe in, in sort of where you see this discussion go in Europe and what your fears are around that is, that the reaction will be one of actually not having that debate, what gets best done at what level of Europe, but to have an exclusion debate on you're either in or out, and this is becoming a holistic plot. I, I think you've hit the nail uh, on the head, uh, that by insisting that things stay the way they are, we may almost be forcing dramatic change rather than more measured adjustment. Uh, we're essentially saying, as you said, you know, in or out, as opposed to how can we change to accommodate these kinds of forces. And my sense is the latter debate would be much more, um, in the long run, beneficial, because you'd preserve what you have, and perhaps when the need emerges, build up again uh, to more uniformity if you think that is right at that point. But right now, the way that things have happened, there's a sense of, uh, on the one side, uh, you know, like it or lump it. And on the other side, well, if that's the case, we'd probably lump it. Gentleman there. Thank you. I'm uh, Peter Young, and I'm an angel investor. Um, I have two short observations or better questions. Um, it, your fascinating speech was basically 
I'm taking the title from your previous book on fault lines, but uh, now maybe with, in another <laughs> context. Um, my question would be, um, in this recent conference of Columbia and Tsinghua University in Beijing, there was a saying that maybe we have to redirect development aid from some developing countries who are doing very fine now to some uh, more developed countries and industrialized countries, as you said, rebuilding uh, communities. Uh, and I'd like to have your comment on that. And with Axel Weber said on, on Europe, I, I observe um, there, there is a trend in Europe um, where people say, after Juncker said, after Brexit, uh, now we, meet, we need more Europe, which was a pretty, um, uh, well, I'm not going to qualify that, but I, I don't think it was a very uh, prudent thing to say. The real debate in Europe is coming to be is not that people are against Europe, but maybe they want to have less Brussels. And that is the key difference to that debate and what was said before, and that ha to have the debate on versus subsidiarity versus solidarity, and that's always been forgotten. That that was the key when the uh, community was founded. So would it then be a very positive development? What I observe is that the council, that is the governments, are taking over in Brussels rather than the Commission. So uh, I don't know enough of, uh, of uh, European structures to have uh, uh, any kind of opinion on that last question. But I, I would say that, that perhaps at this point we need to ask whether uh, more subsidiarity would actually lead to more s solidarity. Uh, a little more flexibility could result. And, and the question is again, where and how because you can't do it everywhere. Uh, it's uh, where and how. Uh, and I think there is a sense in Europe. But I also want to emphasize, it's, as uh, uh, was pointed out earlier, it's also a sense in the US that there is a loss of control. And, and uh, regaining that may be useful. Last question. Uh, thank you. Oh, this one. Constance Hunter from KPMG. Wonderful talk. Um, as I traveled around the country before the election and would meet with CEOs and boards of directors and, and, and some mid-market clients in these flyover states, uh, what I found most disturbing was not the people that were left behind that were um, swayed by the populist ideas of Donald Trump, but this sort of uh, mid-level elite that was swayed by this view and that really felt um, either that others were nipping at their heels or perhaps it was concern about, dis and these are people who are extraordinarily well off, and I find it's very ironic that the better off we become, the more sort of fearful we've almost become of, of any kind of uh, sense of well-being. And, and, and the, the, the massive insecurity that you see at the corporate level among heads of corporations, I find kind of surprising. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. No, I, I, look, I, I, I agree with the point you're making. There are too many people who are reasonably, well, first, there, there is a large quantum of middle managers who have been stagnating and who feel, despite fairly comfortable existences, that they want change. And, and this is a form of expressing that desire for change. But, I have met CEOs who have kids going to Stanford and who feel scared about the future of their kids. Uh, and, and, and so you sort of say, well, <laughs> I mean, if these guys are scared, I do think there is a very real uh, concern, which always happens at a time of rapid technological change. We see the jobs that are going. We don't see the jobs that are coming. And you have to have a very strong sense that things will work out in order to feel comfortable. I do think things will work out, uh, but they need help. Uh, I think you need to help the adjustment process. Uh, and there may be, because of rapid growth, a lot of anger in the short run. We have to make sure that that doesn't upset the system. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raghu. Thanks to the audience, too, for excellent questions. Thanks.